can use that. I was going for a while talking with bad audio, didn't realize because I wasn't mine. I've had that happen once before, and I have to restart OBS to do it. Let's just... Let's just... Okay. Seems to be good. Thanks for letting me know. when I don't quit OBS between broadcasts. Man, I was talking for a while about stuff. Seems to sound better now. Sorry about that. It's happened one other time. This time I'm less far along in the process. So. Anytime that I'm starting on things, I still got a bit to go, so I have time to talk. I gotta make a habit of testing the audio. I just haven't gotten into that habit yet. Oh, 
place this at night my rhythm when talking on the face. And so I sort of lost track of stuff. Anyway, uh, this animation is a little bit slower moving. Seeing what it's like broadcasting a little bit later. It feels a little odd. I did the outlines earlier. So all I'm doing now is 
coming back in and filling in solids. It's only going to get a little bit slower with time. What's happening in this animation is more faces are going to be popping into the space. Pretty full of ink right now. Um, which means that I'm going to have smaller, more detailed sections, and that takes longer to fill in. Hey, hey, Zalek, sorry. <laughs> I'm working through this. Is the audio okay? It was messed up earlier. I think it's because I rebroadcast from OBS without closing it or something. Is that the only real difference? Or maybe it's because I did some other stuff on my computer. Cool. Well, I was talking for like. 20 minutes working on stuff and then someone was like audio's messed up it's like well get to restart stuff again it's okay it's just something where like i was talking for a while about like uh having successful and unsuccessful attempts at making artwork and that they're both positive experiences if you can take it in stride and learn from the varying experiences where if you have positive experience initially that uh, it can give you the confidence to continue on a new methodology or something but if you fail at it it can help you to better learn if you have 
unexpected elements um, and you can better prepare for future endeavors where maybe immediately you're like this will work and then it doesn't work and you're like well next time I know how to make it work and in a similar situation I can anticipate possible issues and better prepare myself for those situations and then someone was like audio's messed up and I got frustrated and sort of made my point and not great because I was like well now I know and I think it might have to do with like usually I close out of OBS and then restart it before broadcasting and so maybe that's the kicker since I didn't restart before doing it this time because I had already uh, streamed earlier. I was looking at the history of cassette tapes and they actually were first uh, like available in the mid 60s and then late 60s 70s they gained a little bit more prominence but it was really the 80s that was their height um of like height of technology sort of stuff but uh they were still outsold by vinyl but that's because singles were still popular uh, on vinyl I don't know if it was cheaper I assume it might be or might have been but then the Kasingles heyday was in the 90s Kasingle Kasingle Kringle Chris Kringle Chris Kringle Kasingle Now I'm getting to an area where I might get tripped up. Making sure I didn't already make this mistake. I did not. Okay. There's a decent likelihood that I'm just thinking like, this fills in that entire area. And I absentmindedly like fill in a gap or an area that's meant to stay white. Slightly on my toes. Uh, I'm trying to think of other responses that I got from the Instagram story thing where I was just asking what people would like to see. There were a few people who talked about embroidery, and that's something that I would have to sort of approach in a different way because. You move both the object and the uh, tool for embroidery typically. You like pull two from and away. So you like hold it and stitch and adjust with both hands and that doesn't uh, film very well. It's also very slow. Like as slow as this process is and then a lot more. Anything with fabric arts, fiber arts tends to be that way. Because you're combining essentially like, if you're going into like individual fibers, you're combining like thousands and thousands of small pieces of things together to make one large thing. Uh, so I need to reconsider what that could be and then people asking about creative process and that's something that I don't necessarily 
Like, the most that I could cover it is most of what I already do, which is just like, here, I'm thinking about this. Huh, hmm, maybe this. And then it's just sort of like, okay, let's pursue that. That's sort of what my creative process is most of the time. Or, I like that. What's happening there? I want to try it. And then I do, and it either works or it doesn't. And that was what got me talking about having success or failure for first attempts at something, and whether or not it's beneficial one way or the other. Uh, and sometimes... Hey, nice. Cool. Uh, I had to ship something twice. Uh, because... Uh, someone put the wrong address on something, and so they were just giving me uh, money for shipping a second time, which I wasn't 100% sure if it was going to come through, but I had already paid for the second shipping because paying for shipping a second time is cheaper than refunding the entire product, and it means that people are just, I think, generally more happy. I'm happier, they're happier, they get their thing, I get a little money. The only person that's not happy is... Maybe the person who... Uh, the fulfillment service that I'm, I've been using for shirts, uh, if something gets returned to them, uh, after a period of time it gets donated to charity. So, maybe that charitable, or gets donated. I'm not 100% sure if it's to charity. I think it just says donated, because I'm guessing if you're working with the sort of volumes that they're likely working with, that there's a chance that it just gets donated to like a fiber mill or something that repurposes the fiber. We're back to fiber arts, but fiber arts on that scale, much different. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I like trying things and learning from it. Uh, sometimes that over-ambitious sort of immediate desire to complete something can backfire in the sense that uh, I get a lot of immediate momentum, and when something fails, it's hard for me to stop with the momentum continue moving, which means that I like spend a lot of time, effort, and energy, and sometimes frustration uh, pursuing something that if I had taken an extra 5, 10, 15 minutes initially to learn and not just jump into it, um, it could have saved me like hours uh, of work. It's crazy learning those sorts of things but even if I do have that experience I have that experience and I learn from it and I can use it for future endeavors after that uh, like when I first was trying to get into animating some gifs here and there I'm gonna switch out that tape uh, I, would, I didn't have like a tripod and I didn't have a good camera for a recording video. So I would end up doing a whole lot of just taking a succession of stills. But because I didn't have the tripod, stuff would get out of, out of whack a little bit. And what I would do is I would just take all of those stills and try to manually align them. Perspective, direction, orientation, scale. Because if you're holding a camera, you're not going to get everything perfectly in line every time. Uh, and so I would spend a fair amount of time in Photoshop realigning those, and I was like, phew. And then eventually I saw something that was like, align layers. You can just do it automatically, and it does like a much better job it uses other elements of perspective and distortion to try and realign it but it meant that I learned methodology and tools within that or used processes within that like I learned 
Oh, if you invert something, like invert the colors and change the opacity down a little bit, then you can get a, like an easier way to see the blending between layers, which I know you can also do like difference or other things. And there's a lot of stuff you can do manually that you can also do automatically in the number of programs that sometimes you don't learn about until later on. Uh, but it's also like in math or whatever practice you have, you learn the basics so that you have a foundation of knowledge, awareness, and ability to process information and understand what you're doing. So if you have to troubleshoot, you can troubleshoot. That you're not just staring at something that's like, it's either on or it's off and I have no idea why. And it could be just, it's not plugged in or it has to reset or something like that. And so instead you just trash the whole thing or start over or get increasingly frustrated that what you, your very general understanding of the object or the work or the process uh, limits you because you're super reliant on the broader uh, usage of it. Which sounds like I'm just like an anti-tech stuff where it's like get the thing that you can fix and work but really it's, I don't know, maybe it's kind of that I try and excuse myself in some way, but I do have some of that mentality. Uh, there's a lot of like intentionally difficult to fix or poorly made or inaccessible, either as a result of trying to make something smaller, more compact uh, when you're talking about electronics or just like it's glued down. This is the end of the other stream. Uh, the stream earlier today, I ran out of time. I just did the outlining of it. And so now what I'm doing, I had to have dinner and I was uh, talking with someone at 8 p.m. And I knew that it would take a long time. So I just decided to do the filling in after eating and such, because otherwise I would have just kept working for like an additional two plus hours maybe. I don't know how long this is going to ultimately take. And it gives me an opportunity to see if there's any sort of different uh, reaction or audience going a little bit later. It's not the best test of it. Uh, because I didn't like promote it leading up to it, it would just be if someone sort of stumbles into it, but ideally I don't really want to do it too late because I like finishing things by like 8 p.m. because it's not just uh, the broadcast, it's not just a live stream, it's then editing footage down, posting it a variety of spots uploading designs and such and that adds like 40 minutes to an hour once I'm done with something but I wanted to finish this today but it's a little bit slower of a process because there are more elements of these little faces so it's only going to get slower as I get further along which is not the most encouraging but that's where I'm at with stuff. I might get done like around midnight, I don't know. Also, probably 
negatively affected by it. Probably also negatively affected by the fact that I have additional stories on Instagram right now because I was responding to some people in their posts because I was trying to get more questions or responses. Where are you at in Red Dead? Still chapter 3. Still at the Braithwaite. So then I forget the other... The other folks. At Fields and the McCoys essentially is what we're sort of playing on. Romeo and Juliet. you're on your way to San Denis. Trying to get Jack back. I think when you go to San Denis the first time you can like purchase an Arabian horse. That means you have one of those, you have the party mission coming up where you just go to the party and talk to folks and then you tail a waiter. Not my favorite, but I do like having a super long beard for that mission. That's the sort of mission that, like, I don't think I've, the few times that I've done it, that there's like a. I haven't gotten like a gold rating or whatever on it. And it's one where it's like, I really don't want to do this again. This is a mission where it's like, I get impatient with it and so I can't get a gold rating or something. But I want the gold rating. It depends on the mission. But I think I usually eat silver or bronze. I care sometimes. It's weird. It depends on how close I got in the mission, how long the mission was, and whether or not like I looked at the objectives and the ways to get gold beforehand. There's variables. These frames are just gonna get slower.
Mm, it's not gonna pop up. Good.
in the swamp. Did you get here? You already got the lures because you were doing the fishing. I always feel bad if I'm hunting and I hunt the alligators because they just sit there. But you can get some big game meat which can fully fill your four things if you cook it. Setting up camp and cooking some gator. Also around there is where you might come across someone who's like uh, vomiting a bunch because they're like, I'm throwing up because I just ate a flower I found. They're like, don't eat that one. And you're like, this one? And you're like, yep, don't eat that one. And then you learn that you can put it on your knife and get a better throwing knife. Something like it. There's also some pricier flowers around there or some more specialty flowers. Halfway done. Yeah, I'm probably not being finished by the next. I don't know. We'll find out. Do you ever do the, uh, like, famous gunslinger mission? That's, I think, like, the first thing that took me to the swamp. That gets, tri gets triggered pretty early on. There's a woman in the swamp that you can 
I don't think you fight her, but you fight with her, and you get to blow up a lot of bounty hunters or soldiers or Pinkertons, I forget. That one, I think, starts when you're still in Valentine, when you go to a bar. You get some good, like, uh, pistols from that mission. I think it's the first, like, not revolver, but, like, straight pistol that I got in the game was from that one. But it also meant that for a while when I would rotate through my weapons, it just was like pistol, 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 pistol. Or like multiple handguns. Okay, that is that. I was just trying to think of missions, side missions that end up in the swamp area. And other than the like ones where people are like, help me, I lost my horse, or thank you, I live pretty close by. Can you give me a ride? Which I usually would do those missions unless I had like a, I had been hunting and I had some sort of pelt that I was like, I really don't want to either backtrack or lose this thing. So I'd be like, mm, no thank you. It's almost like a relief when you have those missions and someone's like, stick them up and you're like, oh, so I can just shoot you and then, and then I don't have to take the time to take you to your house or wherever.
How many frames do I have left? Uh, 20. It might be a minute. These are slower. I am at the point where I think these are going to take the most time. So once I get past like frame 30, the next few, then it'll pick up speed again for how long each frame ends up taking.
finish this one and then I'll put the music back on. I don't think I'm going to have time to make a song this evening. dubstep with just the synth and a little drum kit or, uh, drum machine you could but I'd have to probably record it beforehand before Instead of just what I've been doing is just a recording directly to the cassette tape, which I like process wise, it's a little bit easier. But it means that it's just sort of like anything I do, it's done live or it's a basic. Mash up wub wub wub. I could just do an acapella dubstep where I say wub 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 More on this one. volume level acapella a little bit louder I think I recorded this tape a little bit quieter hello in Argentina Hola, bien. Buenas noches. Forget what the time difference is. is it like two hours? I'm on East Coast time. You're ahead. You're ahead two hours. I thought you were behind. My bad. Well, you're in tomorrow. Buenos noches. Buenos noches. I forget. Grammar isn't great in Spanish. I'm manana. Where you are. Donde estas? That's like, where are you from? No, that's de donde eres.
here in Buenos Aires. Are you from Buenos Aires? I'm from North Carolina. I was like, where was the board? It was board Asheville technically, but first lived in Hendersonville. Asheville Hospital. I've been getting a bit more people finding reels. Finding me through reels because my followers have been going up at a steadier rate and I can look at specific reels. Thank you, Winch. I don't usually stream at this time. Usually I'd be streaming more like uh, 5 p.m. your time but uh, this was a longer one or more complex animation and I wanted to finish it and so here I am I had to do I had dinner and then I came back from dinner and some other stuff and been streaming for hour and a half yeah hour and a half but normally it's 3 p.m. my time so that would be 5 p.m. your time is when I start streaming but a later evening tonight Close to being done. This will speed up a little bit uh, soon because the speed of doing these is uh, it varies a bit. At the start, it's pretty simple, and so it goes by fast how long it takes to fill in the solid areas. And then it gets slow as it gets more complex, and then as it simplifies again, it gets faster again. And right now, starting to speed up some more. It's still relatively slow because I still have four faces running, but the sort of safety zone, so to speak, the amount of space that I have, it's larger areas to fill, which means that it tends to be a little bit uh, easier and faster. Doesn't have to be quite as precise has small little spaces and it'll take like 10 minutes to scan because there are 45 of these and not terribly long after that so. make it into an animation you can see. I probably have like 45 minutes to an hour left. seconds of animation so one two three I've spent however many hours to count to one two three
I work at 15 frames per second. This process, like the animation, is already made in a way that it will loop. Which is sort of why it gets faster to fill in the solids as I get closer to the end. It has to do with the fact that it's like simpler going back to that. It is a lot of work. That's why you don't see all that much. Also why animation is expensive. Especially older animation. It's faster now with digital things because you can like copy and paste and filling in areas is a lot faster. 69 FPS, the perfect speed. Hey, you lost your little first thing. Your little first badge is gone. All right, just a moderator. Uh, this would be less than a second if it was 69 frames per second. I don't know, there might be some like insane person who's... Okay, you just didn't, you didn't have it on one of them, but now it's back. I don't know why it disappeared for that bit in the chat. It's like I'm used to seeing some purple when yours pops up. I don't know. Twitch isn't perfect. I have a badge for yours. So I subscribed at some point using the free Amazon Prime subscription thing. And then I forgot and then I signed back up because I was like, oh yeah, I still got that, but I have to renew it. I thought it was like a, you get to choose. Yeah. I subbed when you weren't streaming it, just was exploring like, wait, I could give you like two dollars at no additional cost to me. But you can't access it for like 10 months or 20 months, wait, like 40 months? Didn't you say like, you know, not 40 months. Like 25 months maybe 20 months you were like you can only really cash out once you get at least fifty dollars was that thing just now i was thinking about uh the tiktok creator program thing i'm getting close to having a dollar Hmm. 
This is ink. This is Sumi ink. S U M I ink. And the brand is Yasutomo. It's Japanese. It's not, it's moderately priced. It's not the cheapest ink that you can buy, but it's far from the most expensive. Ink can get pretty pricey, depending on what kind you're getting and what purpose and all that. But it's a Japanese ink. As, as, I don't know why you would have inked on a tracing sheet. It, part of the appeal for me is that uh, it warps the paper pretty severely because the tracing paper is so thin that the moisture of the ink warps it, but it means that in the animation the texture of the paper is more exaggerated and where there's more ink on the page, the warping is more severe. So if you have just like an area that's solid black, then the surrounding area around it warps a lot. Um, tracing paper also doesn't bleed that much when you ink on it. stays pretty crisp on the edges as opposed to something that might be like a higher uh, or like a rag paper with long fibers of cotton. The ink would just sort of seep into various places in that sort of scenario. But this you get pretty crisp edge lines. But it's not it's not as crisp as if you were using vellum or something that has like a an even smoother or more plasticky sort of uh, surface. Uh, but it means that it dries at a relatively quick pace since it absorbs a little bit but not as much as like a high cotton rag or something I think that's a turf for paper like high rag cotton but I might be wrong I know cotton rag is a term for paper which usually means like longer fibers which there is texture there, but it's not not the same. Also, those papers tend to have a bit of a tooth, meaning that it's a rougher texture on the surface. And it's not my favorite. Um, earlier on, I used, I was using a technical pen more often, a repeatograph pen. Uh, which if you're working on any sort of paper that ha that's not pretty smooth, uh, it drags pretty bad. 
because it's a metal nib. So if you have like a high or a cotton rag paper with a rough tooth to it, you can end up with a lot of frustration trying to take that metal nib along the surface. Come on. There it is. Depends on the texture of the paper. If it's longer fibers and it's a cold press paper, you're more likely to have uh, a rougher surface, which can affect, if you're painting on it with like ink, uh, it's more likely to sort of skip over sections and you'll have a rougher edge because you're just hitting the surface. And if you're using a technical pin or something, not as much like a, what are these called? I can't think of what these are called. Anyway, a pin like this where it has like a plastic nib of some kind, as opposed to this that has a metal nib. Those are called micron, a micron pin. Uh, micron pins work better on a rougher surface than a repeatograph. Repeatograph pins are meant for very smooth surfaces but consistent line weight, more so even than uh, micron if you have it functioning well. You haven't let the ink dry up in it. Uh, but for me, thin versus thick paper, it's less of an issue and it's more of how the ink behaves on it. Um, so you can have a thicker paper that uh, has a very smooth surface that doesn't absorb much. You can also have very thick paper that has a very smooth surface that absorbs a lot of ink or moisture, that it's a like a sponge almost. Those are the smooth ones like that are good for screen printing. Silk screen, screen printing, printing, that sort of stuff. Uh, but that paper gets pretty expensive pretty quick. Like it can be like five dollars for a large sheet, which means, or ten dollars or more, which means that it's like a few bucks for a 14 by 17 section. Paper is very nice and it's archival so it doesn't have any acid. It has a very nice feel to it and it's something that is worth it if you're doing like fine art prints and you're selling them and want them to be nice but uh, so much of the time I'm doing things in larger quantities that uh, mostly exist in a digital space and are viewed for a very short period of time. Which means tracing paper works pretty well for me. Also tracing paper, uh, when I'm animating, it's translucent. It's, I think it's pretty bad economically around the world, but that's Unfortunate that you're not able to. I haven't bought that paper since college, since I had to use it for, I took a screen printing class. My mom, who's an art teacher, is like, you can get a cheaper version than that. And it functions just about as well. I think it's like Arches 88 or something. I think it's a French 
paper company, so it's imported as well. Can probably find it cheaper online, but then it comes curled, and because it's such a robust paper, it's a very thick paper that holds on to whatever format you've put it in. So if you buy it rolled, it'll stay rolled pretty pretty much for the entirety of its existence. Uh, but I can probably find it cheaper. I don't know what the cost is now. It's been five odd years since I bought it. More. No, it's been like eight years since I bought it. It's not good for repeatograph though because it's a softer surface. It's very smooth, but because it's like a cotton rag paper, it's it absorbs uh, impressions as well. I think it might be used or good for like etchings too because uh, when you do a copper etching, it's pretty shallow. The actual engraving that's in there or the etching. It's not engraved, it's etched with acid. Um, it's pretty shallow. And what you actually do is you like cover it in ink and then you shove it into all those little crevices, those little etched bits. And then you take paper that's uh, damp and you sort of press it into it to absorb more of it, of the ink. Doesn't function like how I thought it did initially because I it's not like a stamp where with a stamp what you do is you have a raised surface like a wood block or a linoleum block uh, print a lino cut print uh, those you have a raised surface and you roll the ink across it and because you're rolling it and it's raised up it only touches the raised sections but that's not how an etching works. An etching works by, you cover a plate of copper with, traditionally it would be like beeswax or something. And then you come with some sort of tool and you scratch off sections of it. And then you put that into acid and where the beeswax is, the acid doesn't touch the copper, but where you've scratched it away, the acid goes and it eats a little bit deeper in there. And then you rinse it off, clean it off and such, and what you have is sort of the inverse of what you imagine for like a stamp or a lino cut or a wood block, where it would be a raised surface instead it's a... Uh, subsessed, recessed surface. It's dug out and what you do is you shove the ink into it then you wipe it away on the flat surface and then you take a softer paper that's damp and put it on top and you run it through a press and it shoves it into all those little crevices and because it's a softer paper it can be pushed into it if it were a super rigid paper then it just wouldn't do well. Um, which is why with a lot of etching, etchings, uh, if it just sort of as it is, you'll see an indented surface around the artwork because uh, it got pressed in there when printing. Um, most Printing is a relief print. Like uh, traditionally, a printing press where you, or letter press where you have a bunch of letters, uh, it's lead type that has the surface raised. You apply ink to it and then put stuff on top of that. Uh, I think it's more similar to how offset printing works. 
think that's more similar with offset printing, like how most large scale printing works is you have, I think it's aluminum. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but you have a drum of sorts where you have a cylinder that is made up of a large sheet of thin metal that has been etched in some way. I'm not a hundred percent sure if it's electric or just uh, chemically probably, but you have a single color that's etched in there and you have it then rolled onto a drum that can pick up ink on one side and then let it off on the reverse. And so you can print things continuously. You can roll it along and progress it to the next section. You don't have to have it press down one large section, lift up, re-ink one large section. It's called offset printing is the most common term, at least in English that I know. Uh, and it's called offset printing, not because of the like barrel or the drum sort of thing, but because of the fact that uh, you use five colors, no, four colors. Uh, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, which means black. Um, and you have some sort of pattern of offset dots. That's typically how newspapers would be printed. Uh, magazines, most posters, anything that if you get up close to it you can see a bunch of little dots. That's offset printing. Uh, which is a pretty effective way to print most colors. But you can't print every color with offset printing. Because you're mixing colors. And that's, uh, what is it? It's called subtractive color mixing, where you mix pigments together. And it's called subtractive color mixing. That's like if you were to take two markers, two colors of paint, uh, coloring pencils, anything where it's a medium that's reflecting light rather than producing light. That's subtractive color mixing. And when you mix two pigments together, you end up with a duller, darker color. So if you mix like red and blue together, you get purple. But if you're mixing pigments, that purple is not going to be as vibrant as either the blue or the red. It's going to be a little bit more muddled. So that happens in offset printing as well, where... Yeah, uh, for offset printing, you're mixing four colors. You're mixing cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And if you mix cyan and magenta, you'll get kind of like a purplish color. Uh, but it won't be as vibrant as the cyan or the magenta. But, uh, and also you don't get like perfect, uh, the newspaper will be printed at a lower dots per inch because it's, uh, not a permanent, it's not like an art print or something. So you'll be able to see the dots more clearly. It's also on a rougher paper surface. That's usually like, it's newsprint, which is usually pretty acidic and uh, might be made from recycled materials, which it's good to do, but uh, unless you're bleaching the paper to get it like pristinely white. It's going to be a little bit grayish. Uh, but in offset printing using those like drums and stuff, you can also have spot color. 
which is where you have a specifically mixed pigment or produced pigment that is, can be a brighter color. So if you want to have like a very bright green color, like a lime green, I'm not familiar with gum by chromate. Uh, but if you want to get like a bright lime green, you have to have a pigment that's created some other way, not by mixing pigments together, but either chemically or finding it naturally or something. Uh, because if it's a secondary color, any mix of those four colors, the cyan, magenta, yellow, black, uh, it's going to be darker and duller. But you can do spot printing, which is what a lot of people use uh, Pantone colors for, having a very specific color palette or color. So you can like trademark a color, stuff like that, and then if you use it in your products, you can have it be like a specific color that's much harder to mix. You can have an approximation for situations where uh, you don't have access to that spot color or you need to print it on offset printing or something. You don't have the spot color available or it, it gets expensive if you're doing spot color because needing that additional drum or whatever means that you have to have another sheet of aluminum or another sheet of metal that's exposed and etched and formatted and then it's another thing to align on the printing press. It's just additional stuff, but it can make for better things. Which is why you can have expensive like art prints and stuff like that because there's a difference in that. Um, But if you're working in a digital space and mixing color, it becomes more vibrant. If you mix two colors together, it gets brighter and lighter. And that's called additive color mixing. So you work in like chemical engineering or manufacturing or something, you were doing a lot of architecture, drafting, in school. I don't know what gum by chromate is, but that's two color mixing of some gum. I'm just guessing based on by chromate being like two color. getting close to being done here and then I scan it I might edit the footage in the morning I went to college for graphic design, but everybody has a core set of courses that they have to take, and one of them was color theory. Is it a development lab, like you're developing photos, or am I, I might just not, I'm not familiar with the uh, Term development lab. Okay, different ways to print and develop things. I've worked in a dark room before developing black and white photos, but I haven't 
done too much for okay need about film I haven't done anything with color and I haven't worked with film in a long time I enjoyed it though I did it in high school we had a dark room at my high school I did kind of get tired of uh, just doing basic photography. It also was something where I'm like, I'm not as good as some other people in here at the straightforward photography. That's cool. Doing anything with film gets expensive. Uh, but I started like. That's cool. Uh, do you know the uh, photographer Jerry Yulesman? He's someone who I got into and I still really like his work. Uh, but he did a lot of like pre-Photoshop digital manipulation or photo manipulation. Piling stuff together. Um, he worked at the University of Florida. And when he worked there as a film professor, he had access to like 10 enlargers. And when the students weren't using it, it meant that he could. Jerry Yulesman? Hey, let me type it in. That'll be easier. I forget how to spell his last name. Okay, I spelled it right. You, Oh, I put an extra S. But he did a lot of like uh, surreal photography. by combining photos together and you would use like 10 enlargers at once. But it's something where if you're developing film, you know, like you can't look at it while you're working on it. You have to just know what it is. So it's like these complex things where you're just memorizing your understanding of where things should be and working at it. But it's something that takes uh, utilizing what you have available. Uh, he did some like earlier stuff that was uh, just like using two enlargers or uh, sandwiching it is Photoshop before Photoshop, um, and there are elements of it that are translated, uh, either in no, uh, naming or uh, what the tools look like are based off of darkroom processing. So like dodging and burning in Photoshop, that's in reference to working in the darkroom, it's the same naming where dodging it would be when you had the enlarger uh, projecting onto the film you would have something like on the end of a stick or something and you'd use it to block out the exposure so it would be dodging it it wouldn't get as dark so it lightens essentially that section but it's just not exposing it and then burning, you'd sort of do the opposite. You have like a piece of paper or cardboard or something with a hole cut out, 
and you'd burn it in by just leaving that section or exposing that section for longer. Uh, but in Photoshop, the actual tools for dodging and burning, which are sort of obsolete because that's uh, destructive photo editing. And now you can do stuff with masks and adjustment layers and things, and you don't need to use those tools. But those names come from darkroom techniques. Also, I forget what the material is called and what the uh, what would be in Photoshop but sometimes in Photoshop if you have an adjustment thing that you're trying to isolate it'll be in red and that's from uh, compiling things together you'd have like these red sheets of plastic or uh, like single-sided adhesive. Enlargers, enlargers are cool. Uh, they can get pricey. And if you're working with color for developing things, uh, it's a completely different working space because if you're doing black and white there's a section of visible light that the paper is not sensitive to which is that red light that you're so used to seeing in dark room stuff uh, anything that's referencing a dark room you have like a red light and that's because the photo paper isn't sensitive to that spectrum of light but if you're working with color, color film, it's sensitive to all spectrums of light, which means that you can't have any sort of light. So you have to work in darkness. Or have it maintained within a machine that doesn't allow for any light to get through. Time to reorganize these, and we'll get to scanning soon. You can start to see the reverse of this animation. Looking forward to seeing this one realized. I'm gonna end up working late. I am already working late, but orthochromatic. You probably know the actual terms, and sorry if I'm saying things to you that you already know. Squishy boys. These are some squishy boys. I've been messing with trying to work on my understanding of animating softer bodies and stuff. And how they push and pull and react to one another. It's something that's both easier and more difficult in like 2D. I was thinking about um, I'm the sort of person who listens to a lot of DVD commentaries and that's something I miss with uh, streaming services is that they don't have as much uh, commentaries available, which is something that I don't know too many people who are like, oh, I missed that too. They're like, oh yeah, I forgot that DVDs had that. Anyway, um, listen to the commentary on uh, Monsters, Inc. And they talk about things that are, at least at the time when that movie came out, uh, things that were particularly difficult to do, and one of the things, well, Scully's hair was one of them, but uh, a different element was a sequence where 
Mike is walking, and it's supposed to be that he was in the bathroom and he got uh, toilet paper stuck on the bottom of his foot. But, uh, let's uh, prep things a bit. Uh, he got toilet paper stuck on the bottom of his foot, and he's walking with it, and that sort of more chaotic movement of the paper trailing behind him, something that kind of difficult to accomplish in 3D animation at the time because you're dealing with all of these different polygons and it doesn't. Monsters Inc. wasn't animated frame by frame. There were probably elements that were animated frame by frame, but there's a sequence where he's got toilet paper stuck to his foot. And in the commentary they talked about how that was much more difficult to do than it would be in uh, 2D animation traditional because you just would draw some floppy thing and you'd be done because you don't really register the actual motion of it but to animate it convincingly in 3D is a much more difficult task and so that's one of those instances where you have an advantage and a disadvantage in different ways an advantage is that you can actually like simulate out uh, Scully's hair <laughs> to every frame in MS Paint. That's why it was as expensive as it was. Um, this is face bubble. Pizza. Can I rename this? Yeah, I can. Face bubble scans. It's challenging at that point in time uh, to have done it in 3D animation because it's this naturalistic, chaotic thing, and that doesn't, a computer doesn't do that very well. It likes rigidity and stability in one, two, three. Maybe like order to it because it's working from ultimately a binary of like yes, no, yes, no. Um, but in 2D animation, you could just like draw something kind of chaotic and it would translate, it would be understood. And so there's a contrast and stuff. So when you have like this bubbling thing where there's all of these different sections that are interacting with one another, simulating those would probably be easier, but there are aspects of this that would be very difficult to animate unless you're going in and like sculpting each frame. Namely towards the end where these things are recombining into one another awkward to do in 3D animation compared to 2D. So there's advantages and disadvantages to either. Nah. You can do a version of it, but it wouldn't have the same fluidity of it. And it's better than it was when Monsters, Inc. would have come out. That was... When did Monsters, Inc. come out? <laughs> I think it was before I was in high school, which means it's like 20 years ago. 1969, yeah. We went to the moon and made Monsters, Inc. in the same year. Actually. Uh, what was it? They made Monsters, Inc. to test out the ability to fake the moon landing. And they weren't able to animate toilet paper convincingly, so they were like, we should probably just go to the moon.
The big breakthrough with Monsters, Inc. was doing hair simulation. Which they could only do for like one character to be as robust. And that's an example of like more simulated stuff. Uh, because prior to that you would have had to like animate each hair individually or have some sort of reactive body or something where it's acting in conjunction with as opposed to having a simulation. But even within 2001, was it was it pre or post 9-11? There are some albums that came out on 9-11, including Jay-Z's The Blueprint. His album releases used to be on Tuesdays. They tended to sort of have some achievement as Pixar movies were going along. It varies. And the achievements are here and there. But you can see as they progress, there are certain things that they can handle in Pixar movies. Like early on, toys make sense. Uh, they don't move super realistically. You can dismiss it because they're toys. Um, and you don't have to realistically uh, render skin. So it started Toy Story. You can just animate plastic more realistically. And you do have some characters that are humans, but they're the most prominent one is Sid and he's kind of grotesque. Uh, and then I believe Bugs Life was next. And that's insects. There's not so much concern with texture and stuff. Uh, they were trying to... Two months after 9-11, it was a Chris... No, September, October, no. It was kind of a Christmas release. It came out around my birthday. Oh yeah, because I actually saw that like downtown Disney in California because around my birthday we went to Disney and saw that at the El Capitan. And it was cool to see it because they had all of these interactive elements built into it. We went to like an 11 p.m. showing. It was pretty late for what it was, but they had things where you could like scream into something to try and generate en energy. Stuff like that. Uh, but Bugs Life was second, I believe. And so you're dealing with, again, not realistic skin texture or a lot of soft bodies. It's pretty rigid stuff. Um, but you have some plant interaction and it's getting close and lower perspective and building out that sort of... Uh, you're like my sister's age, my little sister's age. Uh, sounds like you're just, so, uh, because of how it falls in the chat, it looks like you're saying you can't recall 9-11 with the same precision that I can, which probably can't. But uh, also if you're in Buenos Aires, uh, it still affects the world and politics and such, but it's not quite as uh, close to home as being in the U.S. I don't know what 9-11 felt like around the world, but it changed politics in different ways. Uh, and then you had Finding Nemo. Uh, Finding Nemo, they got a little bit more expressive, and it was a lot to do with uh, conveying light in different ways, because you have the reflection of the water. It's still not working with humans as primary subjects, because skin is really weird to render, because it's like translucent and reflective and has little hairs, and it absorbs and reflects stuff. It's more of I jumped out and then I'm jumping back. Uh, but Finding Nemo, you're still dealing with less like 
human sort of things. Uh, with Finding Nemo, they had to add parts to the fish, to their faces, to make it so it, they could express anything. Because fish don't have much inherently to their structure that people can, like, read emotions onto. So they took eyebrows from, like, dogs, sort of, and gave all the fish in there pretty prominent brow lines so that they can express things. And then after Finding Nemo, I believe, was The Incredibles, which was the first major animated feature film to have to be pretty much focused on humans, and they're pretty cartoonish still. Uh, that was a Brad Bird feature, and he is an obsessive person. Uh, but there you start to have a little bit more simulations of human hair, as well as fabric, where fabric was not so much a concern for previous movies. There's a lot of simulation with any sort of fabric. Uh, and one of the more difficult sequences in that movie to render out is uh, Mr. Incredible has his suit ripped at some point and as a means of illustrating his understanding of his vulnerability and the like the destruction of the suit that he has he puts his hand through the hole and the people who were doing simulation aspects of that film were like can you just like look at it like hold it up and then nope, it's got to go through it which is a much different thing i didn't i always forget that like people have different dubs for different movies. Because when I say that, it's just uh, Holly Hunter, uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Craig T. Nelson, and some other folks. Uh, I forget the actors' names. Uh, who's that dude? Jason Lee? Is that that guy's name? He's a skateboarder guy, but he voices, uh, I forget, <laughs> Syndrome. That's a difficult to write. Well, I don't know who voiced it in the Spanish dub, but the director voices Edna. Big Bird is different colors in other countries? I didn't know that. If you go back and look at uh, Toy, or I guess Toy Story 2 was somewhere in the mix there, uh, and that got better with fabrics and rendering some things. Uh, I forget what comes after The Incredibles. There's animation that takes place with the uh, uh, simulation stuff as well, because to have interactions with simulation. There stores Woody. Yeah, uh, we've got treatment of glass in that sequence. Texture, interaction of fabrics, soft bodies colliding with rigid, with a uh, like viscous thing in between. There's a lot of technical stuff happening. Uh, but when you do simulations in movies, you can have to have 
interactions with things. It's odd. Another sequence that was difficult in The Incredibles was uh, a moment where the mom brushes Violet's hair out of her face and puts it behind the ear. That's another interaction of one hard body with the thing and having multiple interactions. You know, like, nope, it's got to be this way. She's got to touch it. It's got to have that connection. Almost done scanning. Did I skip a number? Yep. Okay. This is actually 44 frames, not 45. I'll correct that as I do these. It's actually, yeah, that makes sense. Good. He's green. He's yellow here. The green thing on Sesame Street that's Oscar the Grouch. Okay. Okay. Now, push out the one. Files, scripts, load files in the stack. 
Uh, the tape modern thing was pretty minimal. It was just uh, doing some GIFs for them uh, based on uh, uh, painting that they had. They were doing it with a few different people. That was based less on uh, the fact that I did uh, Trace Loop stuff of this animation and more to do with the fact that uh, I used to run a Tumblr page that was uh, museum gifts, so it was a lot of just animations based on things that I either photographed or found at museums. I just go around and mess with that. It was pretty fun. They had, I don't know what the last time they would have done it or something, but uh, at some point they had a series that was laid at the tape, which was meant to try and bring a younger audience to the museum for semi all less, uh, less typical uh, programming. Today's 26. Well, now it's technically the 27th. Uh, this is the tools. Um, animation 44 frames to sketches. I have not had work that's like outright just sort of displayed at the tape. I've just, uh, I have had work that ended up being displayed at the tape, but it's not exhibited. It's more work that I did based on some uh, painting that they provided me with. That's part of their collection. And to uh, give it an access point for a younger audience that can contextualize it within their understanding. That was a fine experience. Kind of a collaboration, more like work for hire. But it looks and sounds nicer to say that the work that was featured at the Tate Modern That was when I was still in college. That was at least eight years ago. Yeah, that was like eight plus years ago. Zoom this guy out again. Favorite brand to work with? I like early stuff that I did with uh, Converse. Um, just because it was a cut in my teeth and I got to do it in a way that had some sort of identity and originality with it. Um, I enjoyed doing music video for Fiona Apple recently. Uh, Ghostly was fine. Converse was the first thing I did, but it's still like, it was a very fitting thing and uh, the situation worked out for me because I was still in college and they wanted me to come and just like draw on something at their office well the ad agency's office and I was like I can't do that I don't I'm not there I'm in a different state and they were like oh what can you do and I was like here's what I can do and it's better also I'm not like just a straight-up illustrator it's weird seeing like different people's understanding of what you do and don't do um, okay let's actually 
I'm gonna do some of that. Let's create this frame animation. Make frames from layers. Reverse frames. Point one seven. Why does it push over quite so far? minor alignment things. Let's make this much smaller. There's a lot of stuff you can do in a lot of different ways. Curves. A bit darker. Change this to corners. Move this out. Pull this a little bit darker. Selective. We don't need quite so many colors here. Let's just pull it back down to eight. Save this. So let's make test files, create modifiers, my designs, make some silks, drop this silk, come back out. Chaotic. This is harder to follow. But because you have so many things happening, you can understand why it took me like <laughs> almost six hours. Fire. So, oh, there's actually a few people watching. I thought it would just be you two guys. I don't want to crowd out. I just want to move this a little bit. Oh, you still watching? I don't know. She's like actively watching. Anyway, 
but I'm gonna go through my spiel and then I gotta get ready for bed soon. I'm not gonna do too much. I think I'm just gonna wake up and work on the process of this. Uh, anyway, if you wanna watch this stream or other streams in full, you can watch my back catalog of them at youtube.com slash trace loops. You can see a bunch of other ones there. Thanks, Eve. You got a nice little dog there. Uh, you can watch those there. Uh, if you want to buy these straight up stills, uh, or if you want to buy shirts or some other things, or other stills, uh, uh, if you want to buy stuff from me, you can go to traceloops.com slash store. Um, if you want to ship outside of the US, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, and there's not an option to do it directly on my web store, so you got to uh, email me to resolve that stuff and you can do that trace loops at trace loops .com. also if you just have general questions you can submit them there if you want to follow me on other platforms that'd be nice uh, you can follow me on instagram.com slash trace loops you can also follow me on tiktok at trace loops don't think there's anything else to add right now. Um, is this freaking out a little? Okay, there it goes. Back to whatever. Um, it's less I'm sleepy and more that I know this. If I stay up late editing all this stuff, it's going to really mess up my sleep schedule more so than it already is. But I also want to eat a cookie or something. Uh, what was the thing? Oh, uh, I'm usually broadcasting daily at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for what you said before, that it was like 1 a.m. an hour ago, or 1.30. Uh, that means that around 5 p.m. your time. Uh, you can also, if that doesn't work in your schedule, you can go to YouTube and see different live streams. You can't do as much interaction, and I might not be as talkative throughout those, uh, but a different thing to look at. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for watching. I'll be back technically later today. Uh, adios.